Labdien, cienījumie kolēģi! Dear distinguished conference guests, respected colleagues, doctoral students, and ladies and gentlemen, I'd, li I'd like to welcome you all at our BA School of Business and Finance for annual Scientific Baltic Business Management Conference, Challenges of Business Sustainability in the Digital Age, held in Riga. Today's conference is a very meaningful event where we can share experiences through our new brand ASBBMC, though we are continuing with tradition of the conference as an annual event with strong regional, namely Baltic, significance. The conference has been arranged jointly with our partner Riga International School of Economics and Business Administration and uh, our new strategic partner, Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. In particular, I would like to extend my gratitude to guests from abroad um, and our plenary speakers, speakers who kindly agreed to participate in our conference. The conference theme is challenges of business sustainability in the digital age, which is extremely relevant. Paradigm shift uh, related to digital age in business and in whole society comes with new opportunities, new ways of driving businesses, new attitudes, but also with new challenges and risks as well. This creates not only new innovative technological solutions, but also affects the staff competencies, relationships and internal environment of the companies. It requires new theoretical insights and new management culture. I hope that new ideas that will be voiced during this conference will find implementation through new research projects, defenses of doctoral theses and, and future partnerships. I wish our guests pleasant stay in Riga and for all us uh, every uh, very productive, successful work during these conference days. And now I would like to ask to take on conducting of the plenary session and further discussion with the moderator of our conference, Petris Strautinch, the economics expert at DNB Bank, and how he described himself on his Twitter profile, economic activist, lobbyist of the logic, fan of the facts, anti-obscurantist, a wide profile specialist, and sometime unappreciated critic of the banks. <laughs> Please, Peter, floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, uh, I was one of the main public enemies of banking system in Latvia before I joined it. It was exhilarating both ways, inside and outside. Uh, so, today's uh, conference, the, uh, the title speaks about challenges, so it, it, it involves risks, but of course there are opportunities uh, in digital age, uh, otherwise why would we take on risks? So I will ask uh, Mr. Anders Pazov from Stockholm School of Economics to say a few words about uh, risks and opportunities in digital age. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. It's, of course, a pleasure to be a newcomer, I would say, in this, this setting. So I'm very happy that we could join Banco Aug School and Receba to be a partner in this, this event. Um, it's a very interesting title here, and I like, I like words, and I also like some sort of counterfactual analysis. So we have two key words here, of course, sustainability and digital age, and had we been sitting here like 15, 16 years ago, I think everything would have been very, very straightforward. We would say, yeah, it's very good with a digital age. It will kind of help us in terms of sustainability. It will help us in terms of doing things in a more efficient way, so to say. We can save on energy. We can reduce travel and so forth. That was 15 years ago. I think now we have a uh, slightly different view on this when we go from, I do not know what, what is the opposite of digital age, maybe it's, we are still somewhat in the physical age where we kind of still meet on our way to the digital age. And physical age developed you know, with mankind and now we see that 
future is still bright, but maybe not as bright as we, we think. And here I think the program very, in a very good way reflects also the challenges in a somewhat negative sense that comes with the digital age. And we see now, of course, fraud is a very, very important issue. Fraud is in some way much easier nowadays when you can do it non-physical. Even more important, and I'm happy to see that will be covered in about half an hour, that is the security aspects to it, that we are so much exposed to new challenges and to being close to a big, big neighbor who has seen actually these opportunities. I think that's something that we will see more of in the future, and I'm very happy that we address it in the conference today as well. So, having said this, I'm very happy to be, and here I have to look at it because it's a new abbreviation, ASBBMC family. I'm very happy that we've been invited and I would like to take the opportunity to wish all of you a successful conference. Unfortunately, I, and I think I should tell you that I have to run for, for some, to Sweden for some important or upcoming, kind of suddenly upcoming, uh, family reasons, so I will leave fairly soon, but that's not because the program is uninteresting, but uh, I, will, I will be on the plane wishing I were here instead of going to Sweden. Having said this, thank you very much for bringing us in, and I wish all of you a pleasant and encouraging conference. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Anders, now I give word to Tatiana Vesilyev, Vice Director of Research, Riga International School of Economics and Business, to say a few words about why scientists meet, why it's good, and why in this process itself opportunities far by far outweigh risks. Good morning, uh, directors, distinguished professors, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Recibo University, I would like to welcome you to our country, our town, and at our conference. It's our annual conference, and I would like to say that it's very nice and pleasant to see new faces. Each year we see new faces, new uh, young researchers, new famous professors. And uh, I began to think that uh, maybe it's some part of our contribution, of our annual conference contribution that one year you could see doctoral student who is just PhD candidate. After some years he is full PhD and after a couple of years he is famous professor and maybe it's also our, uh, it's maybe a result of our common scientific discussion of our valuable advice to him. Uh, so I wish all of us, very tough, very strong, but friendly scientific discussion. Maybe you could polish your scientific results and your paper and your ideas about your research papers and publish in our common journal, not only in our journal. And valuable, valuable discussions after scientific discussion. Please don't forget about the uh, necessity to create your own network in your scientific research area, maybe not only because in our virtual and our digital century, it's very important to have friends from South Africa, from Europe, from Australia, and we all could do it during our conference, create our contacts, and maintain them all our life. So I wish you every success, valuable discussions, and welcome to Riga, to our conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, good news, we are, we are uh, moving ahead of schedule. This means uh, more time maybe for, for questions. Uh, but now we move uh, to the main part of this session uh, presentations. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Don Ross, uh, Dr. Don Ross, uh, who is uh, working uh, in two universities, uh, University of Cape Town and Atlanta, both sunny places. And 
his uh, area of interest is also very, very wide. He's, uh, uh, in a way, philosopher of economics, right? Quite literally, you have written a book about uh, that subject. But also, a deeply practical man. Uh, you uh, uh, design products for insurance, uh, so you, you apply your knowledge uh, to uh, real, real world risks. So, uh, so uh, I, I want you to speak about uh, uh, building sustained customer relationships in digital age. Thanks very much for that introduction and thank, <coughs> thanks to the school and for the invitation for me to be here. Uh, this is my second visit to Riga. I was previously here five years ago. Uh, we just, I just, my wife and I just got in last night, so I haven't had an opportunity yet to uh, compare Riga today with Riga five years ago, but I'm looking forward to doing that. I've already uh, done enough um, poking around on the web to know that there are new and exciting things for me to see when I have some free time on Saturday. Um, and of course, it's an even greater pleasure getting to meet all of you over the next couple of days. Uh, in his introductory remarks just now, Dr. Paslow, um, quite rightly drew our attention to the fact that we're likely feeling a bit more anxious, a little bit more unsettled these days than we would have been 16 years ago or indeed even 10 years ago or nine years ago about doing business in the digital age. Uh, one, one sign of the challenges for business that I think have, are largely due to the new technology is the so-called savings glut in the world the difficulty that investors are finding uh, in, in locating plausible places to get good growth on, on their investments. And of course, consequences of that are share buybacks, companies reinvesting, um, returning investments to investors rather than reinvesting in new business opportunities. Um, those challenges arise at precisely from the fact that some of the efficiencies that come with the new technology um, also create a, a narrowing set of niches um, for many traditional business operations. And that's one of, I think, the great challenges. Um, I'm going to focus pretty broadly on one whole family of these challenges in my remarks this morning. And these are the challenges of retaining customers under circumstances where the ability of the customers to travel is accelerating and where furthermore products and services are forced to evolve at such a rapid pace that the st former st basis for customer retention in creating customer habits uh, is eroding right i mean you could if, if, to the extent that that customers are engaging in the same consumer behavior for long periods of time they form habits one habit can be patronizing your business but to the extent that the technology keeps disrupting habits, the business can't simply sit back and count on the customer to have a retained habit. The business has got to do something to maintain that customer relationship. So I want to reflect on those themes. I think I'm controlling my own. Yeah. Let's get the hang of this. No. Sorry, this doesn't seem to be working. It's not advancing the slides. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, let's, we can contrast, I think, the recent digital age, the one we're in now, with the early digital age to which Dr. Paslow alluded. So if we think back to the years between roughly 1995 and 2010, I think that historic, looking back from, on those years from a greater distance than we stand now, they will come to be thought of as a kind of golden age of marketing departments. Think of the relative weight in a business, in a typical business, of marketing during those times. What, you know, what parts of companies were typically growing? In what parts of companies were the hotshot appointment, new appointments being made out of business schools? Often in marketing departments. And the reason why marketing became so important during that time was that attracting First visits to a web to your website was relatively cheap and easy. The website ecology was relatively underpopulated relative to the 
growth in the number of consumers and the number of new, um, newly digitally literate potential consumers. Um, so it wasn't hard to get a website up, and it wasn't even hard to get lots of hits on a website. The focus was therefore on how to make a sale, how to create a transaction in a customer once you got somebody onto your website. Hence, the, one of the crucial domains of competition was between marketing departments. Now we seem to have lost things off. Uh, I think there's a bit of a lag is the issue. Here we go. Um, but things are, th we've seen rapid, dram dramatic changes in, in over the last few years in the situation as I was just describing it. Um, Google and its competitors and near competitors and satellite operations have, to a significant extent, monetized what used to be a commons. Growing web, and I'll say more about that in detail in, a little bit later in, in the context of a case study. But in consequence of how much, in consequence of how many operations are now competing for the relatively scarce space available on the web relative to the enormous traffic of potential customers, which in turn allows the search engines to, get, to, to attract considerable rents in order to make it possible for you to appear, for example, on the first page of a Google search, uh, or, or at least within the first couple of pages of a Google search using the keywords that are in turn indicated as being frequently used by searchers. Um, it's very difficult now to try to make money through simple digital marketing. And in consequence, growing your web traffic, increasing your potential consumer base by any means other than just selling a lot, because of course, if you sell a lot, then that in, it, in itself will bring plenty of customers, will, will cause your, um, your site to appear on the first page or two of a typical search, right? Or getting lucky, right? You just happen, some, something that you couldn't, that no one could have predicted happens to cause your site to go, as they say, viral. Um, but growing web traffic through, through, through marketing efforts is expensive and it's unreliable as a strategy. Furthermore, if you've solved that problem by means of sales volumes, that is, if your sales volumes are so high that you naturally appear at the very top of a typical search, well, then in some sense, you don't have a problem in the first place. That's a sign you've already solved your problem. And so into the former privileged niche of the marketer within the corporate organization, now increasingly steps the customer analyst, the kind of clout in strategic planning within firms that was once, that was very, till very recently played by marketing departments is increasingly played by customer analysts. And of course, in some cases, the same people who would formerly have described themselves as marketers uh, are morphing into customer analytics and increasingly in business schools, um, con consumer analytics and courses on big data analysis are crowding out other elements of the marketing curriculum for that reason. And the focus now shifts to how can, from the focus shifts from trying to persuade someone who you've, whose attention you've got to actually make a purchase, to make a transaction with you, the sh focus shifts to once you've actually got somebody that far, how can you get them to stay with you? How can you prevent a, con a competitor from slightly improving their fit for the customer and pulling them away from you? How do you create customer loyalty? Now, of course, one of the phrases that is currently dominating the business education space and the pages of business journals, um, it's one of the buzz phrases of the our current time is big data. Um, we hear regularly that that is the key to, con to customer loyalty maintenance. Uh, and one of the, of course, the aspects of big data that is stressed is the ability of uh, proper use of big data, intelligent use of big data um, to assist with customization, to create closer fits between your product and serve, between a business's product or service and its customer base. Now it's, uh, this is, I, I have ambivalent attitudes towards this phrase. I think there are problems with it. 
Uh, I'll just begin by noticing that statisticians don't like it. There was, in fact, a, a manifesto issued by the American Statistical Association a few years ago uh, against uh, the proliferation of, the, against the promotion of this phrase in academic circles. Um, statisticians dislike it because it's often used to refer to lots of naturally created data or data that is just found, right, data that, that is harvested as a byproduct of other activity and that are obtained by kind of quasi-random search through large data sets where the data are not generated by any active model. That is, nobody designed, uh, nobody, nobody produced the data in order to solve a specific purpose for which they pre-designed um, an analytical machine. And the problem from the statistical point of view with such data is that they're a very poor basis in general for discovering causal relationships because the data don't come structured in a way that suits any particular probe that was in turn designed to sift causation from correlation. But causal relationships are always the primary basis for sound systems engineering. So if a business is setting out to try to design a customer maintenance system and a system for deepening the basis of customer relationships, then what, you, what you're going to need from an analytical point of view is some handle on the relevant underlying causal relationships and some ability to, make, to, 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 to use that, to exploit that handle and to keep deepening that handle, in which case reliance on found data is a, going to be a technical problem for you. Um, I think another problem with the phrase big data is it also can, can, it doesn't necessarily have to, but it can have the connotation that knowing about customers per se is the key thing you want, that that's, that that's the core of your solution. And of course that is crucial, but as I'll be suggesting, it's really only step one of the solution, knowing and, 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 and maintaining your knowledge of your customer profiles is a necessary condition for being able to maintain those relationships, but it's not sufficient. A key step beyond finding data is actively eliciting data and furthermore doing so in categories that are deliberately and strategically chosen. That is, of course, one needs to workshop and ask what kind of data, if we had it, about our customers would enable us to, to continue not just to maintain them but to improve the level of our communications with them and improve our ability to predict how they're going to respond to the next new thing that comes along, either from us or from our competition. Again, from a technical point of view, it's the active elicitation of data that can allow you to establish and test causal relationships as opposed to merely spotting uh, uh, correlations. Another reason for emphasizing active elicitation of data if that, is that if customers can be induced to supply the data actively, if your way of recruiting data is deliberately interactive with the customer, then as a psychological matter, we know that customers are more likely in general to regard that interaction as an actual investment. It was something that they did, not just something that happened to them. That is, they didn't just generate some data, and as a byproduct, that data got used to create a knowledge base about them, but they participated in creating the data on the basis of deliberate, uh, before the fact, uh, contact from a company or from, a, from an ag another agent. And that in turn is more likely to encourage customers to think of the company as in some sense their provider as opposed to simply one of many alternatives uh, out there for them to pick, choose, drop, take up, throw away um, as, they, as, as fashion dictates. But the true key to success, so we've identified a couple of things that are important, but still we're on necessary conditions. We the, 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 the real key here is analyzing the customer data in a way that actually benefits the customer rather than just being designed to benefit the business by making the customer easier to target with the business's marketing. 
Furthermore, the more data the customer supplies, the more data she should be able to derive, right? You want to encourage the customer to keep talking to you. You want to encourage the customer to keep showing you what would improve potentially um, the returns they can get from consuming your product or service. Um, and you want it to be the case that the customer is incentivized to keep talking to you, to keep communicating with you, to keep sending you signals, because the more she does that, the more benefit she's able to derive from her interaction with your product or your service, right? That's the happy feedback loop that can create a continually deepening the investment by the customer. And of course, the really good part about that in a competitive landscape is the more you can induce the customer to invest in her relationship with you, the more you create switching costs for her if she contemplates taking her business to your, comp to your competition. And the way I think about this, about, about what you're trying to do in creating uh, an analytical engine, a way of, use, of, of gathering, using, modeling, and reflecting data back, is that what you're trying to do is build an ecosystem for the customer to reshape the world in which the customer lives, the world of expectations in which the customer thinks and plans, you want to reshape that in such a way that it crucially involves your product or service so that when the customer thinks about what is efficient and good about her life and about her lifestyle, right, among the things that she, she deliberately and explicitly thinks about as the attributes of that lifestyle, that happy lifestyle, that improving lifestyle, that prospectively um, ever more convenient and efficient one is your product. And we can think of some big companies some iconic brands um, that are the current masters of that sort of art. That is brands that are, if you, if you go out and poll people and, and, and ask them what are the key relationships in their lives, what are the key products and services that they think of as, as part of the basis of their happiness um, and comfort and convenience and satisfaction, what, which icons, which brands will tend to come up um, when customers are invited to tell, people are invited to tell such narratives, Amazon, Apple, um, Emirates among airlines has, has certainly achieved that kind of thing. But as I'll be suggesting in the next few slides, I think we'll soon come to think of the current methods used even by those leaders in dynamic customer relationship management and customer ecosystem building. We'll come to think of their current methods, the ones they're using today in 20. 15, 2016, and that in the case of each of them, they pioneered. I think we'll come to think of them as somewhat primitive. That is, at present, the customer ecosystems that Amazon and Emirates have been able to build are, by comparison with what is immediately ahead of us all in terms of potential, only very crudely customized. So I'm a platinum member, platinum flyer with Emirates Airlines. I think they're a terrific airline. I, I, I certainly derive huge value from flying with them rather than their competitors and from having that status. Um, they, know a lot, they know ever more about me and in consequence, they're able to continuously offer me ever more convenience and I appreciate that. And sure enough, there'd be big switching costs for me if I, if I uh, went over to another airline. But when I ask myself, what does Emirates actually know about me, it's very limited, right? They, of course, know quite a lot about where, about where I fly most often. They probably know something about how I spend my money when I'm in Dubai airport, but probably very little about how I spend my money in other airports. Right? They know where I stay when I'm in Dubai. Do they know much about where I stay when I'm not in Dubai? Probably not. And here we're still only talking about very surface level data about me. Think of all potential, how much more might Emirates be able to know about me in order to not only pro proactively try to sell me one of their own products or a product of another company with which they have a profitable relationship rather than a competitor, but how much, what potential is there for Emirates to actually make suggestions to me about how I might redesign my year, about how I might redesign all my, my, my distribution of time in a way that very specifically fits 
my personal aims and professional priorities. What, what is the potential for that? It's hard to think about, right? I mean, when it's, you, can, you can sit there in your chair and you can sort of generate a list. And if I asked each of you to do that, you'd, you'd all generate similar and sl slightly idiosyncratic lists. And then we could go through a long sort of workshop exercise in, we, in which we asked for each item on your lists. well, now, just what would you do with that information if you had it, right? And how would you be able to tell correlations in the big data about that information from actual causal patterns? Could you do that in some systematic way? so that you knew where to focus, because we'd have far more possible targets for focus than a company could actually con effectively concentrate on. Right? I mean, how do you, how we, would we do this in a systematic way? Well, of course, the big change that is now upon us is coming from artificial intelligence. Um, the main reason that Amazon, Apple, and Google are feverishly competing as we speak here today to acquire AI companies, and this is like another dot-com, this, this is sort of dot-com boom too, right? If you want to get rich quick, uh, provided you actually know something about artificial intelligence, right? Get a, find a business opportunity that's just a little bit different from a business idea that's a little bit different and a slogan from the other AI uh, companies, make a startup and try to get Apple or Google to buy it. Um, they're buying, the last estimate I saw, that they're, they're buying AI companies at a rate on average of each um, three and a half per month. Why are they doing this? Well, because they recognize that this is the technology that will allow for dynamic construction of individualized consumer, customer ecosystems of the sort that I've been talking about. The shift that the new generation AI makes possible and this is crucial to understanding the difference between merely learning about your customer and creating through the knowledge that you increasingly have about your customer a whole new ecosystem for your customer. The shift that that makes possible from data crunching, which tends to deliver diminishing returns, so the, you know, the 50th piece of data is worth a bit less to both you and the customer than the 49th piece of data. But it, we shift from that in the new AI environment to pattern learning and discovery. Pattern learning and discovery do not typically or necessarily have diminishing returns. You can get continuous additional value. I wonder, I wonder sometimes about, I think it's, it's generally known by any close students of the business world that AI is an exciting new thing that it's the sort of big, one of the big stories of 2016 and will be of 2017 and so on. But I wonder how many people actually understand or, or are aware of the details of what's actually gone on to create this new, new thing. Uh, I, my, my casual conversations with even um, pretty well-informed colleagues in the business world is that many, many people think that all that's really happening here is that well, you know, computers have finally gotten fast enough Right to be efficient enough to be able to uh, produce to do huge data searches in meaningful tractable time, or maybe that user interfaces have finally got good enough that we can that they that after with all that huge data processing that's going on under the bonnet they can somehow deliver something to your um, they can they can deliver something to your screen that can be processed efficiently. Um, now there's, there's something deeper going on, and I want to uh, reflect a little bit on it. I think it, it matters to how this technology will make a difference to business, what the actual shift in the technology has actually been. And it's been a much longer time coming than I think lots of people realize. So let me say a little bit about the history of this new AI with which I happen to have a close personal connection. The roots of the new AI, in fact, go back to the 1960s. A model of computing called a perceptron was invented in the 1960s by Rosenblatt, who in turn devised the idea of a perceptron by reflecting on the way in which the synapses in, a, in an animal brain work, including the human brain. And what I've, the, the sketch there shows a, shows a perceptron, which is 
a simple connected network with some input units that either are on or off depending on whether some environmental condition is or is, does or does not obtain and which increases the probability of activation of an output unit so those are the two units with the arrows pointing that way um, the output and where the output units control some physical process or response by the machine um, so these are the uh, patterns for pattern what, what one obtains as the system learns is simply changing po probabilities that given that an input unit is triggered the output unit will fire um, and obviously the system learns by being conditioned so the output units are punished to the extent that their output differs from a target and they're rewarded to the extent that their output is similar to a target now these systems developed in the 1960s by Rosenblatt could learn very simple patterns just by being conditioned in the way that I described. And that's exactly how the synapses, all 13 trillion of them in each of your brains work. But because they didn't have any intermediate processing nodes, every node in this little perceptron is either an input node directly connected with the world as a source of inputs or directly connected with some output. There were provable, mathematically provable, and quite severe constraints on the class of patterns that these systems could learn. So provably, a little a perceptron, for example, provably, um, cannot, um, cannot subtract. I mean, it can subtract some numbers, but it can't do subtraction in general. There are pairs of numbers it can't, where it can't, where, for which, on which it can't perform the subtraction operation. And those prove mathematically proven limits on the kinds of functions that perceptrons could compute led to general abandonment of the Rosenblatt research program for about 15 years, right, between roughly 1970 and 1985. Nobody was working on this for a while. But actually, he had the key to what is now our rising phoenix. In 1986, in Pittsburgh, I attended a meeting uh, that gave salience to the so-called new connectionist architectures that were proposed in a few book covers that I'm going to show on this slide and the next. This is uh, Rommel Hart and McClelland and the PDP Research Group's Parallel Distributed Processing, Volume 1, published in 1986. Um, the new architectures that they had developed were basically just perceptrons with one key new feature. Instead of just input units and output units, they had intermediate units, and I'll show you a picture in a few slides. They had intermediate units where the intermediate units weren't connected directly with either out external output or some external input, but only with other units. And that turned out to be the key to overcoming the computational limitations, to creating systems that can, at least in principle, learn any associations. And not just first order associations, but associations of associations, and associations of associations of associations, which is, of course, what all of your brains can do. It was quickly clear on the basis of mathematical work that there were in principle no limits to the complexity of the patterns that multi-layered assemblies of that sort could learn or discover. However, there were practical limits then on the speed and the, on the, both the size and the speed of networks that could either be simulated by a standard computer or actually physically engineered. The book, The Connection Machine by Danny Hillis, published in 1987, um, described a physical multi-layered neural network that he built in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it was roughly the size of a football field. Uh, it was a fabulous computer, uh, but you can't carry it around. Um, I've been waiting for what is happening today for 30 years because I was intrigued at this meeting in Pittsburgh and I didn't have a PhD thesis topic yet. I came away from the meeting in Pittsburgh with one. And I wrote my PhD thesis between 1986 and 1990. I got my PhD in 1990 on the basis of, of, of a connectionist, a model of connectionist learning of language patterns that could be the basis for interpreting and producing novel metaphors. 
So my little multi-layer connectionist system, you could give it a metaphor that it had never heard, ask it to describe what other conditions in the world should obtain if that metaphor was true, and in turn you could, you could also ask it to produce new metaphorical descriptions if you gave it literal input. Right. So you can see why that's interesting AI, right? We're trying to get computers that, that sort of work like human brains. And one of the things human brains are pretty good at is figurative language production and comprehension. Traditional computers are terrible at that. Can't do it at all, actually. Um, so let's see if these uh, new connection systems can do it. Now, my system, which is described in the book, uh, subsequent, published subsequent to my thesis that I show here, my system could only handle, however, single sentences. So you could give it a one sentence metaphor and it will give you single sentences back of literal statements that it thinks are sort of key truth conditions for that metaphor. Or you can give it single sentence literal descriptions and it'll give you single sentence metaphorical equivalences back. But that but it can't do any it can't deal it can't handle or even understand or or focus on systems of metaphors, interrelated rich systems of metaphors like you'll get in a Shakespeare sonnet. But in fact, most of the creative power of metaphor to extend conceptual resources in the way that people do, to make their worlds new and different, uh, relies on systems of metaphors, not single sentences. So from the point of view of practical utility, my system was a toy. And there wasn't much else I could do with that toy in 1990 because I simply couldn't build a neural network with enough units in it to get beyond the single sentence le level. It was, phys it was beyond what engineering allowed. Well, these systems are toys no more. Between 1990 and now, there was no magic moment. There was no sudden line we crossed at which multiple fast processors at last had enough affordable miniaturized power to make large neural network architectures practical. But we have, but we gradually moved into that space. We've arrived at that space now. Architectures of this sort are now discovering relevant, interesting patterns in language and thought that no person could try to anticipate. There are things you could do, of course. You can, you, can, you can cultivate certain habits of thought that make it more likely that you'll just accidentally stumble across new, um, uh, new insights, new patterns. And we all do that. We all do it quite regularly, but it's not systematic. The power of these things to systematically find new, discover new patterns that nobody's ever thought of before in big piles of data is unlimited and ultimately is way beyond the power of the human brain. Those machines are with us now. These are not speculative anymore. So now, armed with systems of this kind, a business can use data acquired through interaction with a customer that will allow discovery of potential ecosystems for that customer ecosystems which, remember, incorporate the company's product or service, that neither the customer nor the company could deliberately set out to find. Workshop all you like, right? You're not going to find these things. Poll or survey the customer as much as you please. The customer won't be able to tell you that that's what they want in their ecosystem. The AI will, will, will discover that potential lurking out there and inform both you and the customer. So the AI, the, the, this new AI introduces a new business capacity which goes beyond management of large data sets. Yeah, they do that. But to that crucial next extraordinary step of creative sculpting of previously unrealized potential that lurks in those data. Now I'm going to work through one slightly longer case study and then a very, very short one and then I'm wrapped up. Obviously, it's good. Let's, get, let's take this, these general ideas now and show them at work in a couple of business settings. And the first business setting is, is one where most of us, or many of us have some direct, not only familiarity with, but a stake in. We've got some skin in this game, many of us in the room, and that's universities, which of course are a, a, bus a business sector under stress at the moment. There's widespread anticipation, particularly in the United States, of a pending shakedown of universities. There's a lot of universities that are really, really scared at the moment, that there's gonna be far fewer universities soon than there are now. Um, and the, the view is that the shakedown is coming mainly due to scale inefficiencies that have been exposed by escalating costs of university education provision 
and the inability of the system to respond adequately to rising demand. So there is rising demand in the system, is, is, but very rapidly diminishing returns in the way the system is responding to that demand. Now, each university naturally wants to be among the survivors of this Schumpeterian wind that is blowing in everyone's faces. Digital technology is sometimes thought to be the source of the problem. I think it's not. I think it's no, basically no part of the source of the problem, but I, I'll pass over that today. Um, but to what extent can digital technology be part of the solution to the problem? Well, let's break the problem down into its components. And I think we, cannot, we can take that, this, this, this general sort of Schumpeterian issue for universities and separate it into three elements. First, the traditional model, the model most universities have always used and use still now, doesn't scale up very well, doesn't scale up adequately or fast enough without public subsidies on a level that the public is simply not going to provide. Another serious part of the problem is that the model front loads a very broad focused education into a single early stage of life for most students. And then for the most part, universities leave it up to other sectors, other parts of the education provision landscape to provide the more narrow focused skill upgrades that students are gonna need later in their careers. And finally, the model tends to be one size fits all. That is, whole huge clusters of students get basically the same product in a way that doesn't differentiate among them. And that's a problem when they're going out into labor markets that increasingly want to see very dynamic, not, not only differentiation, but dynamic differentiation. Differentiation that feeds more differentiation through natural processes. Now, if all public research universities try to solve their financial challenges, and or they try to expand access so that they can service more students. Just by trying to grab geographically more extensive market shares through online provision, and of course that is what lots of institutions, particularly in America, are doing, this is not a tactic that can work for most of them. And the major problem has just become evident over the past couple of years. So four years ago, I think lots of universities were sort of optimistic about just being able to push online products out, get lots and lots of students in the online courses, um, and to that extent at least cope with some, at least the scale, scaling up part of the problem. But what's happened in the last few years we've seen is that the cost per lead generation through digital marketing has risen sharply because there's so much competition among providers. So now Amazon is able to scoop those rents or Google, pardon me, not Amazon. Google is being able, to, and, and other search engines, are being able to take those rents. It's, it's becoming prohibitively expensive to do the digital marketing. Late last year, I was involved in testing the cost of digitally marketing a postgraduate diploma in business strategy badged by a large public US university. The cost per lead, which 18 months before would have been perfectly manageable, had soared to nearly $50 per student. That translates into, uh, um, and that translates into an unaffordable total recruitment bill, right? You won't cover that with student tuition. So unless you have a very expensive product with few direct competitors, unless you're running uh, a, a systems engineering course or a design, a, or, or a very funky new design, architectural design course out of MIT, um, this isn't gonna work. I want to reflect briefly on a product that we launched at UCT a few years ago, just three or four years ago, with a private sector partner called Get Smarter that we call Across Africa. This is a series of not for credit, but rigorously assessed 10-week business courses that we sell throughout the African continent. Uh, we've served for now 40,000 students. And we've achieved 92% completion rates, successful completion rates, which is almost unheard of in the online education space. What, why, how do, did we pull that off? Some of our key drivers were intensive interaction between students and conveners, between students and tutors, and between students and students. So it's very, very structured, it's very social. We had course designs that were very close, that were carefully informed by very specific pedagogical principles that are specific to online engagement. That is not just uh, transfers of things that one historically does in a physical classroom. And we fully integrated our system with social media so that our students were facilitated in being able to create networks with each other 
while they went through the course, so that they came out of the course not just with the material they'd learned, but with a learning community they felt part of. We used the digital marketing and recruitment based on pay-per-click lead generation of the kind I've just been talking about. And we provided each student with a personal coach, where the coach was not a subject matter expert, but rather was given a dashboard, a constantly maintained dashboard, of analytics of the student's learning progress, which the coach would use to monitor and be the basis for phoning up the student and saying, I can see ways in which you can make more efficient use of your time in this course. I can see ways in which you, you might be getting yourself into a bit of a cul-de-sac, overstudying this because you're good at it and understudying this other thing you look not so good at, whereas it should be the other way around, man. Right. Uh, and so on. the coach didn't, in other words, the coach in a marketing course, the coach didn't know anything about marketing. That wasn't the coach, that's the tutor's job. The coach studied the student and the student's pattern of learning and gave feedback to the student to improve their learning. Now, the first three elements on this, in this set have come, have, uh, they, which are typically defined the so-called high-touch online delivery program pro, approach in education. They're now becoming standard best practice, so they're not our competitive advantage. And the fourth element, as I pointed out, the digital, the, the, the digital marketing and recruitment based on lead generation, uh, pay-per-click, based on pay-per-click is already becoming unviable, at least in many markets, certainly in America. But I want to focus attention on this last element, the coaching, and what the coaching stands for in the context of the wider problems I've been talking about this morning. We introduced coaching. I, I, I don't, we actually didn't. This, coaching wasn't the sort of brainstorm we had out of the blue. Um, we introduced it mainly in order to improve our completion rates. We had completion rates in the 70s. We wanted to push them up into the 90s. We thought, how can we do that? And so we then invested quite heavily in our learning analytics capability, that is the analysis of the student learning patterns that produce those dashboards the coaches use. We invested in those in order to make the coaching work, right? So first we thought, well, we need coaches. The students need to know there's somebody watching them, paying attention to them, so that they don't slack off, right? So they don't put the work off till tomorrow. Now then we thought, how could the coach know what to say to the student? Well, the coach is only going to know what to say to the student if the coach has data about that student. How are we going to, and so blah, 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 we backed into creating this big learning analytics engine. But this thing that was a means to an end as we first conceived it, I want to suggest, has now become an end in itself. We've realized learning analytics is the key here because it's the basis for creating a fine-grained, customized model of each student and it can be pre-processed by intelligent software. If the coach has had to do all the processing of all this data, Right? Each coach, then the whole thing would become unaffordable. We'd need, so many, we'd need as many coaches as we have students. Coaches can keep big caseloads, making a phone call to students where each phone call lasts on average about, about six minutes, and make those calls from nine to five every day to maintain a big student caseload because there's all sorts of, of, of highly intelligent pre-processing of the student data being done by our AI. Adaptive learning, so learning where the learning methods change and adjust to accommodate the particular cognitive biases and cognitive problems of the specific individual student. So adaptive learning based on applications of machine intelligence to the student work doesn't actually require online education. In principle, you can do that, and some institutions do do that based on classroom-based work, physical classroom-based work. However, the more the student does online, the more information there is to enrich the individualized dynamic data and the responses to it, which makes it setting up the whole system much easier. And in consequence, we're in the early foothills of integration between that kind of adaptive learning and, here's the new thing, lifetime educational achievement portfolio management. The online student potentially brings her whole specific person, personal ecology with her into the learning environment. You can see all about her, far more about her when she's learning from home than when she comes and sits in your classroom and has come into your space bringing only the things she chose to bring. When you are dealing with her in her own natural environment, you've got, potentially got access to her whole ecosystem. And that, of course, is all just for the analytic mill that can improve the level of customization you can deliver that student. So the successful public university, the ones that are going to survive the Champaterian wind, 
will be those who can retain the prototypical student for their whole career, whole, not just their whole student career, their whole career, by serving as their ongoing educational advice service. And the university can add value in this role by keeping and monitoring a record of the student's learning achievements, the student's best competencies, skills and knowledge gaps, so that you can warn them about the knowledge gaps and advise the student on ways to, to fill those knowledge gaps. By proactively monitoring relevant labor markets in order to be able to look ahead on the student's behalf and give each student lifelong educational advice in real time, tailored to that student, and then, of course, provide the courses that, the, that you've identified for the student that she now needs. And providing each student with a branded suite of career advancement tools, including the student's detailed learning portfolio, making sure that that learning portfolio is understood and respected by her potential employers. So you equip her with a continuously updated portfolio she carries around to the job interviews you've advised her are potentially available on the basis of your analysis, which you make available also to prospective employers, of what she's good at. I'll pass over this, but it's important, but time is pressing. And making the student's status as part of the university's learning client community a core part of her own professional identity. I call this educa Higher Education 3.0. To distinguish it from two previous models, the university will no longer see itself as mainly selling degrees in this environment. It will see itself as offering ongoing career-long client support. Its relationship to a student will be more like that of a law firm to a wealthy client or a family doctor to a household. Households tend to retain family doctors for years and years, decades. Wealthy clients keep the same lawyer until the, unless the lawyer blows something up for them. Um, Similarly, we want students who want to keep your university as their provider all the way through their lives and keep coming back to you for more. And it's high-touch online course delivery, plus, crucially, the learning analytics software applied to the online data record that keeps accumulating that, for the first time in history, makes that kind of service relationship possible. Now, clearly, one thing that follows from all this is that if, if, uh, if the university can provide the, the, the learning and analytics has to be the university's own IP. You can't outsource that part. If the university can provide tailored analysis of its students that others can't, then the student has an incentive to maintain her relationship with the university, at least to the extent that the value of the information remains fresh. But it only will if, you, if that learning analytics capability is the university's IP. You can outsource the platform. You can outsource the coaching. You can outsource the tutoring. What you can't outsource is the data analytics. Do that, you've given away the basis of your advantage. So two lessons from this case. First, businesses can't, as I just, well, first I've already just stated it, businesses can't outsource their analytics system. And the special reason for this has to do with the nature of this AI technology. And that's why I wanted to go say just a little bit about how it works. Right. Each Learning analytics system, if it's a connectionist system, will, be, will become more and more different over time. It evolves idiosyncratically as it learns. So the longer you use it, the more special to you it becomes, and hence the more proprietary it becomes. So you've got to own it. And therefore, the tension with which businesses will need to strategically grapple, the one with which we are grappling now in our cross-Africa system, is between building customer-related ecosystems that are, on the one hand, so idiosyncratic that you can't communicate clearly to third parties that aren't integrated into the ecosystem. That doesn't work. We've got to be able to tell the students as potential employers. We've got to show them data they'll understand. It can't be data that we understand and our students understand, but nobody else can make head or tail of it. On the other hand, we've got to steer a fine line between that and having data profiles that are so generic that they don't establish customer lock-in because our competitors could do exactly the same thing. All right, very short case and then I wrap. Um, 3D printing. Back in 2012, there was a prevailing view across lots of the business world that a new corporate behemoth on the sort of Amazon or Apple model was likely to emerge in the 3D printing industry. And quite a lot of investors, me among them, 
um, tried to guess which of three or four firms would be the big winner. I can put cookies uh, in that, try, try, to, try to hit that behemoth. It didn't happen, right? We don't have such a behemoth, and now it looks like we probably aren't going to. Um, what happened was the demand for the machines grew too unevenly, and also too, that says too unevenly across different sectors of potential use and different styles of machine development, and also too slowly, especially in the mass consumer market, for anybody to lock in a standard technology. That's how, of course, you become a behemoth in this kind of market. So most of the investment attention has now shifted from the machine market itself, which looks like it's clearly going to be commoditized across a bunch of different specific sub-markets, to the market for designs, that is for 3D product design templates. Now in the latter, where you're talking about 3D product design, 3D printing possible designs, the major question is how can you hold on to your IP, right? How would you avoid being in the situation of the music industry or the publishing industry, uh, how do you avoid having all your profits pirated away? So this is a sustainability challenge, right? And it's a sustainability challenge that arises from the ease with which uh, digital information can be stolen, it can be used. The trick that companies are now trying to play is to become specialty providers to small numbers of large clients, large corporate clients, right? and to write licensing contracts with those clients that gradually shift IP in the components of what they call a design line, a sequence of designs, where one design feeds the next design, over to the client. Meanwhile, the idea of the business model is that the 3D company's growing familiarity with the client, just in, so this is just like the university's growing familiarity with the student, can allow the company to build an ever more complex joint ecosystem with that client that can justify a continuous investment in that design line by that client, just like we were trying to get the student to continuously invest in her relationship with her lifetime university provider. So the business model is that at any given time, there'll be multiple design lines at different stages of maturity for a given corporate client. There'll be some fully mature design lines where the IP will sit completely with the corporate client. And there'll be new design lines starting up where most of the IP will still sit with the provider. This is just getting going. Is it likely to work? Should you be rushing out after this meeting and buying some stock? Um, the obvious risk here is, which echoes what happened to a number of suppliers to US auto manufacturers in the, in the 1950s and 60s, is that each company gets pulled into a highly specialized relationship with a single client chews up all the company's resources and leaves the company hostage to the long run strategic success of that client. When GM fell on hard times in the face of Japanese competition, it took an awful lot of specific supply businesses with it. They all went bankrupt, of course, GM didn't. They did. The solution to this problem might again lie in proprietary AI learning analytics systems that allow the 3D companies to become full-fledged R&D consultants to suites of companies. Right, so in other words, once again, um, uh, the, the key for the 3D companies, own the right stuff. Don't own everything, or, you're hot, or, or that will tie up all your resources and you will be hostage in the way that creates this risk. Right? But own what you've got to own, which is that proprietary learning stuff generated by your AI. The key property of the new AI te technology I try to state in this slide, and then I'm pretty much done. Program digital solutions of the old kind we're all familiar with tend to converge to standard to standards. That is, they, that is a diminishing returns point. And that naturally implies erosion of IP. Right? If, you're, if, if there's diminishing returns on the value of your IP, um, its value erodes. By contrast, neural network architectures of the kind I've talked about this morning naturally grow more different from one another. This is a point I've made before as their learning paths get longer. But since they're constantly responding to new information, that doesn't, unlike with conventional uh, computing software, doesn't need to lead to obsolescence through over-specialization in a niche. They don't tend, they, it's the, what's going on here is not just ever tighter refinement of a problem you pre-designed, it's unpredictable new expansion. And so the crucial management task, if you're 
trying to operate a business relying on software of this kind, relying on architectures of this kind, the crucial management task is to develop architectures that are like raccoons, right? That is, they're generalists. Throw them into a new niche and they'll find new, you'll see the new capacities you never knew they had before. You'll discover, you know, raccoons move into cities and we discover that they're really good at removing bricks from mortar. Um, you don't want a panda, right? Something that over time evol evolves into a highly specialized bamboo eater and that's all it does and can do. But you also don't want a crocodile because a design that is so good that evolution builds it once and leaves it alone. It never needs to change or diversify. That, of course, becomes a commodity and soon your competitors will have it too. It's a great product, but easy to copy. In buying up all these AI companies, Google, Amazon, and Apple are trying to monopolize all of this capacity, right? Of course they are. <laughs> they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be them if they weren't. Um, I'm doubtful they'll succeed, I think precisely because of the open-ended nature of its potential, but they certainly are trying and will continue to try. And my last thought for today is I encourage all of us to have take the attitude that if we see them show, if we see signs that they are succeeding, we must urge our political representatives to intervene. We don't need a monopoly. This is one place we really don't want a monopoly. Uh, and with that, I invite questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank you, thank you. That was a great presentation. I'm also very, very thankful to organizers of this event for their uh, chronological realism. Uh, in other, uh, in most conferences, it just 15 minutes are given for each speaker, and, and it seems that, that those people never learn, but it's, 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 in this place, it's perfect from the beginning. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, we have a little time for uh, questions, if you have. I have, but I'm not priority here. Uh, so, question? Yes? No? I, I don't see. Raise hands. So, uh, may I ask a little question, which is also semi uh, comment? So, you emphasized in the beginning and the end that, in a way, uh, the world is big, or internet is becoming Googleified, right? If you are in the first top 10, you are there. If you are not, you are not. Uh, I, I also once read on edge.org, which is a brilliant website, that internet is also becoming wikified. Uh, many terms are uh, explained in Wikipedia, which has huge bureaucracy, which operates according to certain procedures, and and so uh, in a way, you you get lots of use on internet, but somehow it's very becomes standardized, um, and, and and so I started to think, what can small uh, economies like Latvia do in such a world, which is winner takes all ecology, right? Uh, uh, some obvious answers, um, niches, uh, if you make good niche product, they grab attention even on these uh, global platforms, which happen to be located in the United States mostly. Uh, in, in Latvia, it has been also, there has been another way. Um, in Latvia, we have had um, more successful uh, national uh, level platforms. For example, uh, Latvia wa was a very difficult uh, country for Facebook to take over because we have very popular uh, local platform. Also, we have a very popular uh, local email server, which is also uh, doing some business abroad. So earning exports revenues, maybe other sorts. What can, how can we survive in such world of, of crocodiles and raccoons and pandas? <laughs> right. So, uh, so notice one, 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 potential sort of strategy that you identified in the question um, can work for a while and can and, and so, so it should be it should be done but there's a panda risk there right I mean if Latvia becomes if the Latvian uh, social network becomes the one and only social network that does a certain thing and then does that certain thing better and better and better and better over time right there's the risk right that, that, that that's what Lat that's what Latvian social networking becomes it becomes the bam you know if you want it if you want a bamboo eater go there but otherwise you go, for everything else go somewhere else that's the panda worry um, uh, once again the the this technology that I'm talking about the new AI pos provides a potential way of breaking that Googlefication the, the the Googleization as you called it right of the internet um, because precisely again because 
these systems grow in ways that are open-ended. I mean, if, if there was any distinction I made, and I knew I, ha I know I had to make it quite fast, so I should probably just come back to it and make sure that, uh, uh, that, that, that I maximize the chance that you sort of see that as important here. Um, the key difference between traditional comp software and big neural networks is that in the case of the traditional software, yeah, the thing can get better and better. It can get faster and faster. It can get more and more efficient. But it's getting more efficient at only what you asked it and designed it to do in the first place. Hence, the diminishing returns issue. But an open-ended learning system like a big neural network, when you build it, you don't know what it's going to be in five years. You don't know, and you, and you know even less about what it's going to be in 10 years. You should expect that in 10 years you're going to have a totally different kind of thing. You had no idea that you were building the seed of that thing. Um, and so the diminishing returns problem is solved. So, it, so to that extent, Latvia starts, right, with, a, with something that looks like a bit of a panda. But if the world wants raccoons, and indeed it does, I mean, it's raccoons that succeed, not pandas. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's the possibility that your thing will turn into a raccoon-type beast that you could not have imagined when you designed your, your cute panda. Right? And, so, um, and if everybody's doing that, Right. What we might hopefully get is increasing a stage of increasing diversification instead of what we've had, which is this period of, of lockdown uh, into a few uh, increasingly clunky standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Okay. Uh, uh, we will also have time for questions and answers, of course, in, 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 in the discussion part. Uh, so thank you once again. Thank you again for uh, your attention. Thank you. So uh, now I will give floor to Mr. Jans Kazuotinc. Those of you who are here from Latvia, of course, know him very well. Uh, I think that uh, 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 most of us here are more theoretical risk experts, right? Uh, Mr. S Mr. Jans Kazuotinc has uh, uh, lived more according to the ethos of uh, uh, Nassim Taleb, so skin in the game, right? You were soldier in the British Army, and this is a dangerous job, somewhat dangerous, even in, in peace times. Uh, and, uh, now you are uh, Lat one of Latvia's main strategists in dealing with also kind of hard threats, so you call it, right, in jargon. So uh, I, I'm sure it will be a very interesting presentation. And uh, so uh, Mr. Kajuotin will speak about uh, business sustainability in security context. Well, thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. But I have to say that after um, Professor Ross's uh, lecture, which was absolutely fascinating, um, it's quite a tall order to keep uh, your attention. Um, I'm going to be talking about completely different things. And I will be putting an emphasis on misunderstanding and miscalculation, things which can go very, very badly wrong for us in the early part of the 21st century, because the risks which we are looking at, which affect uh, every individual as well as business, are arguably much more dangerous than they were during the period of the Cold War. How easy it is to misunderstand, um, I can uh, illustrate with uh, the example of uh, the Californian businessman um, who employed a North Korean refugee uh, who was uh, delighted that he had this opportunity in a free society to be able to work. He's a very, very good worker, always turned up on time until one day he phoned up uh, his boss and said, boss, I'm, I'm really not feeling very well. Um, I think I can't come into work today. And the boss said to him, well, when I feel like that, um, I usually make love to my wife and then I feel better. Why don't you try it? And he said, OK, boss, Ran, uh, rang back two hours later and said, boss, you are absolutely right. I feel great now. I will be coming into work. Uh, boss said, that's really good news. And he said, uh, and by the way, boss, you've got real nice house. We live in a very dangerous world. What I'm going to talk about first is a very quick look across uh, the board 
And then because we are talking about uh, Baltic business uh, environment, I will, of course, be putting a great deal more attention towards Russia. Now, if we look at Europe, we are faced with threats both from the east and from the south. And our biggest problem is that we, as the West, not just Europe, are acting in a reactive way. We are not able to anticipate adequately the threats which we are coming up against, which from a business point of view is completely unacceptable. Uh, from a security point of view, it's even less acceptable. Um, and when we do, we are uh, reacting in ways in which those uh, who uh, do not wish us well are able to exploit. For instance, terrorism is now being made an equivalent of migration. The fact is that the vast, vast, vast majority of migrants are not terrorists, or are, are pretty unlikely to become terrorists. The fact that some terrorists have come back to Europe from, for instance, Syria uh, uh, amongst the migrants uh, is certainly something which the security services need to think about. But um, re let us remember, on the most part, these are second or third generation immigrants who have grown up in Europe and have European passports. Uh, in the same way, um, if we're talking about terrorism uh, in the digital age, we inevitably have to face the, uh, the conflict between freedom and uh, anonymity, particularly uh, on the internet, and protection and security. And uh, it is very similar to the procedures we go through uh, to uh, board aircraft at um, airports, that we have to give up a certain uh, uh, degree of freedom to go through to our embarkation uh, gate because we know it is better that we are all searched very carefully and then there's much less chance that the air airplane we board will be blown up. But we haven't really been able to grasp this nettle as far as, uh, as uh, communications and, um, uh, com and IT systems are concerned. If we look a little bit beyond um, uh, Europe, the results of the Arab Spring. Well, in 1972, when Nixon uh, first visited China, uh, China's Premier Zhou Enlai was asked what he thought about the re results of the French Revolution. And he said very famously, well, it's too early to say and uh, this was meant to illustrate that China takes the long uh, approach to um, what happens in the world. In fact, he, he was probably misunderstood because he was probably referring to the uh, almost French Revolution of 1968, four years earlier. Um, and then, of course, it would be too early to say. But uh, I can tell you as an um, ex-intelligence practitioner that the um, outcome of the Arab Spring is very unlikely to be clear for us for at least a decade. If we look um, a little to the east, Syria is an absolute mess, partly because we, the West, have been unable or unwilling to become involved early enough, partly because um, nobody anticipated that Assad would be prepared to use the sort of uh, means that he has. Daesh is actually called the Islamic State, though we know that the whole point is for them to masquerade as a state, which of course they are not, yet we talk about them as the Islamic State, not Daesh, and therefore they gain this uh, momentum particularly amongst disaffected, radicalized young people um, outside the Arab world, which allows them to recruit, and they still recruit quite actively. We have the Iran versus Saudi Arabia 
uh, tussle which will go on for a number of years yet. We have the unsolved question of Israel and Palestine. Will it be a two-state solution or will Israel um, turn itself into an apartheid regime? In sub-Sahara Africa, we see that Boko Haram is exploiting the weakness of many of the countries there. And this is, again, something which will have a direct effect on Europe through migration, particularly while Libya is uh, so, um, uh, so insecure. In the Far East, China has very strong ambitions and the way that they are behaving in the South China Sea is extremely aggressive. It's extremely dangerous and again we are seeing things which we did not see during the Cold War. North Korea remains a major problem. It's a major problem for China. Why is China supporting stability in North Korea? Because China knows better than anybody else that when the North Korean um, regime falls over, there is going to be trouble for everyone around. And China would rather put off the evil hour um, rather than see uh, horrendous change come about. And remember, if you have um, a regime which falls over, which has um, demonstrated a nuclear weapons capability, those weapons can fall into the hands of all sorts of people who we would not like to see them have. Japan, Philippines, a number of other countries all feel threatened. Japan is becoming uh, much more muscular herself. Looking further across the Pacific Ocean in the Americas, Brazil seems to be tearing itself apart with the possible impeachment of uh, Rousseff. Venezuela has uh, painted itself into a corner. And with these two very important South American countries so fragile, the whole uh, of the southern continent is fragile. In North America, well, I don't think anybody in uh, Europe particularly wants to see the Donald succeed. And Bernie, quite frankly, is probably as dangerous for those of us who believe that the NATO alliance is the um, most important structure for our own European and in particular Baltic security. In Europe, the left and the right are on the up from Front National to UKIP to Viktor Orban in Hungary. And the EU itself is very fragile. Will the Brits really vote for a Brexit, despite the fact that anybody who knows anything about economics understands that that would be a disaster, not just for them, but the rest of us? And what effect will that have on NATO? And then there is Russia. Russia wants to retain or regain great power status. The most recent polls show that uh, a majority of Russians, over 50%, now would like to see the return of the USSR. That is a change over the last year. So what are they doing? Soft power with a hard edge, you could call it, using economic power and hard power. There is a particular role for conventional uh, power as well. And we saw this demonstrated in Ukraine. For the Ukrainians, there is no military solution to the Donbass crisis. Because as we saw in uh, the second half of 2014, the more their anti -terror, Ukrainian anti-terrorism operation succeeds, the more Russia ups the ante and brings in sufficient forces to deny the Ukrainians a victory. And the Ukrainians have understood that. We need to understand that as well. But of course, Russia's aims in the Baltic states probably differ, differ considerably from those in Ukraine. Why is Russia interested in the Baltic states? Well, let's look at geography. Twice in relatively recent history, Russia has been saved um, by strategic depth, once from Napoleon and once from Hitler. 
um, the uh, uh, security uh, concept which uh, Vladimir Putin signed on the 31st of December of last year names the United States and NATO as the main threats to Russia. In other words, we are seen as an enemy. The enemy is at spitting distance from St. P and Moscow. That is a threat. At the same time, if we look at our own geography, we see that the Baltic states' borders with the Russian Federation, Belarus and Kaliningrad are over 1,500 kilometers. And with NATO countries, a whopping 104 kilometers, the so-called Suvalki Gap. Now, uh, defending against um, a, a determined attacker with superior forces along a front of 1,500 kilometers is not really um, a military option. Therefore, we have to think of other ways. And that's why Russia is saying that the Baltic states are indefensible. And why Russia is de developing what they call new generation asymmetric or non-linear warfare, which for crazy reasons we in the West have decided to call hybrid warfare. The Gerasimov doctrine, named after the chief of the general staff, um, Vladimir Gerasimov, um, tries to blur the lines between war and peace internal disorder and external aggression, and most dangerously of all, conventional and nuclear conflict. The essence of the doctrine is to do that which is not expected. And uh, in other words, Crimea and Donbass are not necessarily models for future operations. In other words, Narva or Ladgale are not going to be the next Donbass. They are likely to do quite different things um, in order to um, exert influence over the Baltic states. One way is to use the compatriots, because in Latvia and Estonia there are substantial numbers of uh, Russian-speaking compatriots, and a great deal of effort has been put on that um, from the Russian side, using soft power, which, uh, okay, it's an un uh, unfashionable idea these days, but it seems to work because it harbors back to a common USSR history, Russia, uh, Russian media, uh, especially television, the language, Russian culture, which everybody uh, values very highly, history, and of course, sport. In the digital age, we must also uh, remember that it is not that we have far more information. In fact, most people probably have far narrower um, set of information tools which they use because people tend to follow and read that which they choose themselves, that agree which agrees with their opinions. And that is, of course, very dangerous. And that is how self-radicalization -radic develops in the Muslim world and in other uh, 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 environments. The Russians have developed information warfare very, very well. And Peter Palmerantsev and Michael Weiss at the end of 2014 produced a, an extremely um, good uh, uh, booklet on the weaponization of information, energy, money and corrupt practices, which really is worth reading, even if it's uh, just the executive summary. It suggests that the West is weak, corrupt, degenerate, post-Christian, and talks about whataboutism. The aim of this information warfare is inevitability, that you, the Baltic states, whatever you do, ine inevitably you will go back to the Russian sphere of influence where you belong. The messages are your failed states with incompetent, corrupt governments, you discriminate against your minorities and re you're returning to fascism. Well, we know that's not true, but if you say this often enough, particularly to Western Europeans who don't want to uh, spend more money on defense, then after a while they start thinking, well, perhaps it's true. Perhaps really the Baltic states don't 
um, live up to their obligations, maybe they really are not worth defending. Then, of course, there are economic pressures, which I don't think I need to talk to you about, um, and uh, cyber pressures. The first serious cyber attack was in 2007 against, uh, the, against Estonia at the time of the move of the bronze soldier. Well, um, those sort of attacks and preparations for attacks are continuing all the time. And there is very good reason to believe that in the case of the Baltic states, the Russian Federation is very directly involved. So would the R Russian Federation attack the Baltic states? And if so, why? Well, here military people talk about capabilities and intentions. It takes a long time to build up capabilities, but only a moment to change intentions. And we have seen that in the exercises Zarpad, which means Western Russia, Zarpad 2009, 2013, the Russians have exercised um, ways of putting um, a bubble over the Baltic states, occupying the Baltic states and cutting them off from uh, Western uh, NATO support. And when I say bubble, this is what in military speak is called A2AD, anti-access area denial. It is the kind of weapons systems which would prevent aircraft or ships able uh, to be able to bring reinforcements to the Baltic states. And by God, the Russians have got there with S-300, S-400 um, air defense systems, which are extremely modern, Iskander missiles and a range of another op uh, other options, some of which were dis uh, demonstrated in Syria, in particular the caliber uh, cruise missiles. The Russians have, uh, have uh, demonstrated their ability to project forces, their renewed nuclear capability, and their strategic mobility. Are they prepared to do it? Well, in March 2013, Putin told the Russian Military Historical Society that the winter war against Finland in 1939-40 was justified. And why? Because it corrected a historic mistake. The mistake was that the Finnish border was too close to Leningrad, as St. Petersburg was called in those days. Uh, and therefore, it is justifiable to use military force to correct mistakes which were made uh, dozens of years earlier. And what does Putin think was the biggest mistake of the 20th century? You got it, the fall of the Soviet Union. So, while Russia may not have any immediate intention of attacking the, uh, the Baltic states, we need to be very much aware that, what, uh, that it is a possibility. So what should our response be? Well, resilience, deterrence, self-defense, and of course, collective defense. There should be an as asymmetric uh, response to asymmetric threats, and that means Banks, money, that is where the Russians hurt. Develop resilience against propaganda, cyber attacks, subversion, armed infiltration, and terrorist attacks. All of these things are is essential to modern countries, and they need to be um, put in place so that they can be used very quickly under those sort of circumstances. We need proactive measures exposing Russian lies and information distortions, and the, pro, uh, the uh, broadcasting of interesting programs and truly objective news in Russian. Deterrence is something which can work. During the Cold War, Berlin was uh, only defended by three weak uh, infantry brigades, uh, which the group of Soviet forces in Germany could have taken out um, in very, very, very few hours. But nobody on the Soviet side even contemplated that because they knew it would lead to war. And therefore, it's very important that we now also are quite clear that uh, an attack 
against the Baltic states will involve the, uh, the whole of NATO and the European Union. Maybe not immediately, but um, certainly at the beginning there will be a number of countries, including most importantly our strategic partner, the United States, who have pledged to do just that and have forces here. And I hope that after the Warsaw Summit in July, we will have increased force uh, presence in the Baltic states. But there is another area that we haven't looked at carefully enough, and that's the economic area, something which um, matters to you. When I said A2 AD and a bubble over the Baltic states, what I'm talking about is uh, the reality of 21st century warfare. That reality is such that if the Baltic states are involved in um, uh, a uh, Russian military adventure, then that will mean Russia needs to have control of the whole of the Northern Baltic Sea, the Barents Sea, because all of that is indirectly linked, and that our um, non-aligned friends in Sweden and Finland will be involved, as they now understand very clearly, whether they like it or not. Now, that's fine if we're trying to persuade the Swedes to start to think about joining NATO, where in fact a small majority now are, uh, are in favour, 41% for, 41%, for, 39% against, which is quite interesting. But what about the economic aspects of it? Well, before sanctions um, uh, were brought in place, 60% of Russian trade was with the European Union. It's now somewhere around 50%. Much of this goes by ship through the Gulf of Finland and the Northern Baltic Sea. If the Northern Baltic Sea becomes an area of warfare, there will be no civilian shipping passing through. There will be no civilian flights. And I cannot for a moment believe that the European Union will continue to pay for Nord Stream gas or any Russian gas or oil if members of the European Union have been directly attacked. What does that mean for Russia? Well, it's not sanctions anymore. This is far, far more serious. They will be cut off from money suddenly and absolutely. I wonder how well Kudrin has explained that to his uh, erstwhile friend, Vladimir Putin, because um, the decision makers in the Kremlin are not economists, but they ought to be thinking about these things. Most important, we must learn to manage crises because we are playing with fire. And the sort of things we saw in the Baltic Sea in the last week with uh, Russian aircraft buzzing um, the US destroyer uh, Donald Cook and then doing a barrel roll over a surveillance air aircraft is absolutely crazy because that can so easily lead to a small mistake and then it's very difficult for either side to back down. The best way of dealing with these so-called hybrid challenges is with legitimate and effective government. And this is where NATO and the EU have different roles to play. NATO can do the kinetic bit, the EU must do the good governance bit. And that means all of us sticking together. And that's why I think it's so very important that the United Kingdom does not leave the European Union. But we should also look ahead. I know that many uh, analysts might not agree, but my belief is that we are looking at a Russia which is not very dissimilar to the, Russia, to the Soviet Union of the 1980s. We know that change is going to come. We can see it, but we don't know when. It may be in a few months' time. It may be two years, five years, ten years, or even longer. But it will come. And the question is, what are we now doing to make sure that uh, that change will be of a sort which makes us in the Baltic states feel comfortable. Because uh, let's be clear, 
Our aim should be that in the future, in the 21st century, our relationship with Russia should be identical to that of the uh, uh, Dutch and the Belgians with Germany. And remember, Germany invaded Holland and Belgium twice during the 20th century. They did it to us here during the 20th century as well. Therefore, I don't think it's completely out of the question. We ought to be thinking right now how we can support um, uh, Russian free thinkers, uh, uh, Russian democratic thinkers, because the time will come when they will have to take up the um, uh, take up their uh, pens and swords to fight for uh, democracy in their own country, and it is up to us to help as much as possibly we can. I've run out of time, so I will stop here. I guess we'll probably have time for questions during the um, discussion period. And for one small question now, too. That's possible. Yes, yes. If there is a question. Stand silence. No, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay uh, now I will give floor to, to, to Jets Berzinc. If I may say a few words, it's now a popular talk uh, that the uh, time for banks is basically over, right? Uh, there will be fintech and, 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 and new, all new kinds of fancy technologies and nobody will need banks anymore. But, uh, but then I sometimes reply, reply that in, in, uh, it might be so in, in some Western countries, but in Latvia and, and Baltics, why do you need uh, fintech uh, uh, companies that provide financial services if you already have IT companies that provide financial services, right? And you can say like that about banks in Baltics, which are on average much more efficient, lean, uh, and technologically advanced than, 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 than banks in um, Western Europe and indeed Swedbank. Uh, well, DNB, of course, is also good, right? <laughs> but but Swedbank in many ways has uh, led the way in this area. So a floor to Mr. Berzinch. Okay, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, yes, uh, banking in uh, our region, uh, modern banking started when uh, it was already internet, at least somewhere around the corner, and uh, onboarding of customers obviously happened when uh, internet bank uh, was already a case, which was not the case in uh, many Western countries. So no big surprise is that uh, banks nowadays in our region are I would say more IT companies than uh, traditional uh, money counters. So, uh, and it means as well that um, some of those global trends, which are around uh, digital, uh, which is uh, today's agenda of uh, conference, are affecting the banks. And uh, so, uh, I will try a little bring some highlights uh, because time is really very limited and i can speak i think for hours but uh, so i will try to watch if petris is raising hand with five minutes but uh, i will not pay attention uh, but uh, okay i will i will try to highlight uh, what is on our uh, our agenda and uh, uh, what is going to change as i predict that uh, there will be some changes and some of them quite substantial I will as well try to demystify some things about the banks and uh, and give some hints on future. So this is uh, shortly agenda. So uh, first of all, yes, that's no 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 wonder that we are living in very interesting uh, times. Uh, we can say revolutionary times. That uh, uh, I just recently bought. Uh, uh, light bulb for my bicycle, uh, this front uh, light bulb, and uh, it asked uh, to uh, update firmware. So uh, it, it's unimaginable, uh, even some uh, years ago, that uh, what the hell, why you need to upgrade firmware for, for light, but uh, uh, it connects wirelessly to uh, this uh, GPS device and uh, it uh, changes uh, this angle depending on the speed. And then rear light uh, is integrated with radar, which screens if uh, cars are not approaching behind and uh, highlighting on this uh, GPS device that cars are approaching. So beautiful things, but uh, means that uh, you constantly 
definitely need to upgrade the uh, firmware, uh, not only for uh, for a smartphone, but refrigerator and, and light bulbs. And uh, you need to upgrade your firmware yourself as well, as we know. And I think this is one of uh, tasks uh, for this uh, conference that uh, add some new uh, thinking uh, neurons and, and, and release some dopamine of pleasure out of, uh, out of this event. So, yes, this is today's reality that you cannot probably get uh, knowledge uh, even in a university which, suffici which is sufficient for whole your uh, career and uh, that I can admit that even I see some professors uh, from Latvian University which uh, trained me but uh, sorry some, some things uh, stayed but uh, lots of things changed so I needed constantly upgrade my firmware myself. So uh, yes this is reality and uh, this reality today is affected by two big uh, trends or two big forces and uh, one is a uh, topic of this conference so I will pay maybe more attention to this which is called digitalization another is uh, called consumerization and in a way they are uh, flip side of the coin that uh, digitalization has released consumerization and uh, uh, consumerization is driving digitalization furthermore so uh, this is uh, again uh, things if you speak about digital you cannot forget about those who are consuming products of them and especially in banking. But uh, digitalization, for digitalization, uh, this year is uh, very interesting because we can say that uh, from one side uh, or one side of the coin, uh, digitalization is celebrating 51 years uh, today, uh, 51 years of uh, Gordon Moore's law. Uh, Gordon Moore worked uh, in, in Intel and uh, 51 years ago formulated uh, his observation into the law that uh, each, uh, in simple words, each two years uh, capacity or productivity of computing power doubles. Uh, 51 years uh, it's, it has been uh, uh, exponential development and uh, on, on, on right side from you uh, you can see what means exponential that uh, if you throw one ball then it uh, pops up uh, in next step two then those two are releasing four so uh, you cannot see it uh, 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 other than in slow motion so uh, this is condensed uh, exp explanation what power has been released by one ball maybe in uh, 51 years ago so uh, uh, understanding maybe in uh, if other industries and technology would follow the trend, what will happen? What would happen if a uh, car industry where we see that cars are very progressive ones, but uh, still uh, if they would uh, double each second year their productivity capacity, then uh, today we would uh, be driving cars with the speed of uh, half a million kil uh, kilometers per hour. Uh, car would consume zero dot zero 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 one liter per hundred kilometers and the cost of the car would be exactly three euro cents so uh, that uh, that's potential what is released uh, by this uh, digitalization but not yet consumed by car industry and uh, most obviously by other industries as well and st so i believe still a lot to do even for uh, banking so uh, yes we uh, one can say that uh, banking is uh, like um, like big elephant, yeah? it's uh, slowly changing and basically all industries are now digitalized and banking is the same as it used to be and, and nothing happens. I would say this is one of myths which we are living around and maybe as well why so many startups are turning into fintechs and think that oh now this is an industry which we will kick whatever organs they are targeting. So uh, uh, this is not uh, exactly true because um, digitalization and banking the, uh, banking is actually one of the first industries which started to apply uh, computers in in customer service and uh, this is a yeah, now this is a picture uh, which as well has around 51 years uh, it is a picture of um, first uh, transactions uh, in uh, so-called uh, ATMs yeah, we know ATM abbreviation and uh, it's it's like uh, with us it's it's with us uh, more than 50 years so and how you can take money out of ATM or how you can provide the service yes there are some myths that there is somebody sitting inside and then just uh, giving money out but uh, not true uh, you know it's uh, probably better as, as as, uh, as many others from society but uh, uh, yes it is uh, 
digital and to provide the service digitalization is needed to be made. So it means that digitalization in banking is uh, at least from those times when cards uh, became as a global standard 24-7. Uh, globally working uh, payment instrument. It's only digitization uh, what, what can drive it. And uh, yes, so I would say that uh, banks are not maybe like uh, big elephants, they are more like big planes. And by the way, this is as well products out of uh, 60s from uh, last century and still <laughs> with, with, with us, so Boeing 747 or, 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 or Jumbo uh, JT, this is maybe more like banking. It has some digitization, uh, some parts of it uh, maybe are running still 1960s and biggest and most important thing, uh, one must understand that uh, why maybe banks are yes slow with some things problem is that banks are flying yeah so it's the jumbo jet uh, which is uh, flying and yes uh, there is now a new concept uh, how maybe this uh, uh, pilot uh, cabin should be uh, built on uh, problem is or challenge is that uh, yes we can do upgrade but uh, this upgrade needed to be done on flying plane so we have no luxury to land the plane and then uh, for two years make some uh, reassembly and and then uh, go back in the air cards are working 24 7 so this is a huge uh, huge uh, pressure on on company which is providing services and obviously it's uh, easier to build this plane nowadays from scratch and build to uh, and go to uh, higher limits uh, in in space and so on and so uh, this is uh, uh, why again fintechs are, are are applying and trying to get something out of out of those jumbo jets problem is that uh, or challenges as well that uh, uh, passengers somehow enjoy those jumbo jets and uh, 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 reboarding in the air is not maybe the uh, most uh, uh, convenient thing so this is about digitization and banking but digitization uh, uh, in banking brought uh, one more substantial change uh, yes it was 1660s uh, when again Swedes uh, brought uh, um, uh, banknotes to Europe uh, uh, yes yeah, so we have some relations with Sweden uh, and uh, uh, so they brought uh, banknotes to Sweden uh, to Sweden and then to Europe and it changed the way how uh, wealth can be accumulated how wealth can be exchanged uh, and uh, then uh, it was 1820 when uh, Swedbank happened in Sweden and it it, it introduced a branch concept and now you can put money not only in the drawer or somewhere but you can uh, bring it to the bank but uh, some things were not changing and some things were not changing that uh, uh, you were uh, transacting we tell nowadays in the same channel as you control it but then cards appeared again okay you can uh, transact and you can see your balance in in, in atm but uh, where new digitized uh, services appeared then we started to uh, see this uh, so-called first we saw this multi-channel that uh, you are transacting in uh, in cash you are controlling your open wallet and you see your balance uh, basically then you transact in, uh, in cards uh, you go to, in, uh, to atm you can see your balance then internet bank yes uh, but in internet bank you can start to see uh, not only transaction balance out uh, after internet transaction but as well after card transaction so this uh, control interface uh, started to differentiate for, uh, from the way where you are making transactions and nowadays with mobile it's even more changing the the game because now customers are paying with cards paying uh, in in internet some payments are done even automatically on visibly like in uber it's somewhere hidden and 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 mobile becomes uh, the main hub where you control uh, your 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 finances and yes uh, this is today today you still have multiple channels and i would say in baltics uh, dominating channel is is currently is internet but uh, looking from sweden's perspective and uh, which is some two years ahead in this mobilization we can call it then uh, we can easily predict uh, that in uh, uh, two three or five years uh, mobile it looks from today's size will be really dominating channel where you control your finances but there, then there will be different channels where you are executing your your, your finances why it is important why i, I state this because um, we must understand that digitization is targeting in banking two layers one is so-called product layer you are digitizing the transactions another you are targeting this interface customer interface and this is not exactly the same thing and this is not exactly the same competition which i will touch uh, in a in a few slides 
So, um, yes, the digitization has released uh, one more trend. So, a few words about uh, this consumerization. Uh, yes, uh, Steve Jobs, we know, was a genius. Uh, he produced some uh, nice toy for a thousand bucks, and then people were queuing, waiting for a new release. Uh, now things have moved uh, even further. Uh, I think Elon Musk is uh, even more genius uh, because he produced a thing uh, which he is now selling for a thousand bucks. You can prepaid and uh, this Tesla 3 car and then uh, you, 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 you are queuing for it. You are paying thousand bucks, but you are don't getting even this gadget you will get it in uh, 18 or 24 months so he, he he has made things even more ingenious so he is getting money up front even if uh, the thing is not delivered yes one thing is this digitization and the paradigm shift uh, how you are driving and how you are uh, consuming uh, content but another thing is i think uh, which is really manifesto what those people are queuing for they are not queuing for, for gadget. They can get it delivered to their home. But they are queuing for emotions. Yeah? They are queuing for, 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 for this release of dopamine. Yes, I was one of the first, uh, and I see others around. So, uh, compl uh, complimenting Dr. Ross, yes, this is uh, something uh, beyond just, uh, just, uh, just delivery of service. This is where you are on, on already on next level uh, for, 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 for emotional touch. Okay, uh, uh, now back to banking. Uh, another illustration uh, of banking, it can be like that. Uh, um, uh, actually, banking is very lucrative industry because everybody thinks uh, that there is a lot of money, and obviously there is a lot of money, but uh, uh, one can uh, have to remember that the uh, biggest part is, is not exactly bank's money, it's, it's customer money, and some fintechs maybe are missing that point, that uh, you, you cannot uh, kind of put uh, this money in, in, in your pocket. And even more, you need uh, much more money to attract this customer money, you need uh, substantial capital. But whatever, uh, banking uh, profit and loss statements uh, in good times looks uh, very lucrative, banks are ge generating, as we can call it, like jam, yeah, so we are generating gem and then there are those uh, uh, flying animals uh, or, 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 or insects uh, flying around uh, wasps yeah, which try to get this gem from, from, from the banks. Yeah. And uh, the most uh, kind of uh, be better the gem, the more wasps are attracted. And, and this is, I think, today's reality. Those fintechs are trying to get uh, those uh, gem in parts where banking has maybe been too, I would say, greedy. Uh, some services are really giving uh, lots of uh, profits for, for the banks. Uh, however, banks were doing so far some things uh, like, um, I would say, cross subsidization some services are for free uh, some services are maybe more expensive than than they should be but uh, these fintechs are uh, showing that uh, this business model that you can first control everything uh, second uh, that you can make those subs uh, cross subsidies it's uh, soon to be over and uh, some of services which we are enjoying free maybe will not be free to uh, tomorrow because uh, in order to protect this uh, some part of business you need to add price tag for another so you lower prices in one uh, service uh, but then uh, inevitably there are running costs for this uh, jumbo jets so um, and uh, uh, a bit as well, more symbolically, uh, this is a bit philosophical video that um, what you can do, uh, what uh, uh, you can fight those wasps. Yeah? You, you, you don't like usually wasps yeah? because uh, what wasps are doing, they are carrying uh, this uh, gem away from you or, or honey away from you. But uh, if you manage to do some slight genetic modification of wasp, maybe you can get a bee. And the uh, difference from bee and wasp is that bee carries uh, honey for you so uh, this is uh, a bit uh, hint uh, what uh, banks can 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 do turn uh, wasps into bees but uh, uh, back to why I highlighted this uh, two parts of the banking this interface part and this uh, this product part yes uh, many fintechs are attacking for this uh, uh, products part uh, but uh, even more fiercer competition I would say that ultimate competition nowadays uh, is uh, actually not for products, it is for customer interface. Uh, because uh 
Also, this uh, exponential developments had uh, shortened some things uh, and, and, and so on, uh, but uh, there is uh, one thing which they cannot uh, change, uh, at least so far. There are 24 hours per day, and this is 24 hours uh, what everybody wants to get customer attention. And uh, opportunities for dopamine uh, uh, or uh, options for dopamine are increasing. Customers can now enjoy Game of Thrones, they can enjoy Facebook or, 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 or some local social media. So everybody wants to capture this uh, customer attention. And even more, those who, are, who have captured this customer attention, they want to go further. Last year in the United States, uh, Facebook launched service uh, that, uh, where you can send the money to, uh, through Messenger to another Facebook uh, participant, and you can do it free of charge. Uh, so instant free of charge. Uh, where is the catch? Yeah, so uh, uh, a catch is in, in that that uh, this time uh, which you spend uh, within Facebook ecosystem and yes, di some digital traces what you are leaving behind for Facebook are more valuable than costs to provide those payments. So uh, they can in a way sponsor or you are basically by being there by your time and by your uh, small traces, you are uh, buying a service uh, of uh, some, some basic services. Yeah? Uh, at the end, yes, uh, game is, is, is not uh, charity. You will buy most probably some more expensive value added service. Yeah? But this basic service to get in, it's, it's, it's uh, free. And uh, uh, yes, it's a uh, battle for customer time. And this is uh, 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 it's scientific uh, um, conference, so something about numbers. So uh, uh, in banking and in many industries, uh, uh, this is a number. Yeah, this is zero. Uh, we know that banks are living now in zero interest rate environment or even slightly negative yeah, or even more negative. Uh, some, as I remember in university, it was like very theoretical concept when I was there 20 years ago that <laughs> negative interest rates, uh, no, are you kind of, no, theoretically it can be, but... Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, zero rates appeared and then negative. Nowadays, uh, there is another zero approaching, and this zero is not approaching tomorrow, but I think it's, uh, it will arrive by afternoon, that uh, some of uh, or quite many of basic services will be for free. Yeah, some basic banking will be for free. And it's actually nowadays reality. Uh, m most popular service in Swedbank, uh, intrabank payments are for free. You, you, you take it as a granted, but uh, no, it, it is so. Uh, one of most popular digital services nowadays in Sweden called Swish, person-to-person uh, -person mobile payments, it's for free for private persons. Companies are paying, uh, private persons are enjoying it free. So this is new reality, and uh, most of uh, participants in, in banking market uh, planning their next or after next uh, year plans uh, how to put it into their strategy discussions and so little hint we are doing that uh, not uh, when or if uh, but uh, what we do when uh, what we do with that yes so we need to face it so and basically uh, uh, banks are facing two options going ahead maybe third option doing uh, go going in both directions but uh, uh, basically banks need to assess and uh, if they are strong and they feel that uh, they can uh, capitalize on this customer interface, yes, they go to the road where they focus on digitization, further digitization of customer interface. Uh, and uh, by that, uh, they have to be ready to onboard not only their own products, but uh, which is not very traditional for banks' products, uh, adding more value to customers than pure bank utility, uh, which is payment and, and loan. This is utility, this is not customer need. Nobody needs mortgage loan. The person needs uh, housing and mortgage loan is a tool. It's not a need, so it's sometimes uh, mixed. And uh, uh, um, banks can be in tools or utility business, yeah? so uh, providing extremely efficient services. But then the competition will be global. It's, it's inevitable. Yeah? So those interfaces, those digital interfaces uh, today, uh, overnight will uh, rene renegotiate the conditions for utilities which are supplying this uh, uh, final customer service. Customer don't care whether money is in bank A or B unless it's, uh, until it's uh, protected by this uh, deposit uh, insurance. And uh, even European laws are kind of uh, 
promoting it. Uh, PAD directive uh, is promoting uh, free switching uh, of uh, utility part of the banking. PSD2, which is coming in two years, uh, is promoting switching uh, this uh, interface part. Or anybody who has bright idea on interface can uh, can now come to this legacy bank and say, uh, now I will uh, sit in between uh, your products and and your customer. Um, yes, so uh, biggest uh, biggest challenge going ahead for the banks, which are going this uh, relationship part, is is this what is on the screen? Uh, so far, banks were being, in, in, especially in our region, very successful in this uh, internet bank. Yes, it's a dominating channel, uh, nothing to do there. However, uh, now new reality is coming. Uh, this is this mobile reality, and rules are different. One can say that what's the difference now? Internet is as well as well in in this mobile mobile device, but rules are, 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 are much more different. Uh, when you were running branch model, br branch banking model, you basically need nice booklet, you needed nice uh, agreement form and teller which is uh, signing for the services. When you, internet, uh, when you entered the internet era, uh, you needed this uh, self-service, self-serviceable product. So products need to be digitized and interface that customers can, can activate, uh, apply, fill in forms and so on. Uh, mobile is changing the rules once more, so you need to step uh, some steps uh, up because nobody will fill mortgage application in, uh, in, in, in mobile. In mobile you will be basically having, no, no one even will be browsing for services. Services will appear close to the place and point and time, uh, close to the need, uh, hopefully some seconds before. So, ah, yes, I need it now. And uh, and uh, only option uh, how you can sell it is yes, no, and more info. So it's it has to be really, but it's different marketing logic. Yes, it's uh, big data or it's prohibited word as I know now, but uh, uh, yes, uh, this is changing again. And uh, many banks uh, are still struggling to from this uh, moving from branch model to, to internet, but uh, this is obsolete by already today. So uh, this is a new uh, battleground. And in this battleground, uh, banks are not competing uh, basically between themselves. They are competing between other interfaces. Uh, uh, they are competing with uh, Facebook. They are competing with probably Amazon. Uh, my colleague just returned from China. Uh, and uh, in China, banks uh, missed the uh, point of digitization and they Actually, now uh, uh, internetization, because internet was not so much around these years, uh, now uh, it's a huge uh, penetration of smartphones and banks have lost in China momentum of, of uh, capturing digital interface. Uh, within last 24 months, uh, two other players have completely captured the uh, uh, banking interface, company called Alibaba. No, that's some uh, analog of Amazon, and even more company which is called WeChat. Uh, it's analog of, uh, in a way, Twitter or or, or Facebook. Uh, and uh, now uh, this WeChat, which is social network, uh, it has 900 million, 900 million customers. Uh, they are providing payments, uh, consumer lending, uh, and uh, yes, banks are obviously supplying uh, this accounting behind, but interface is captured by somebody else. So. Uh, this digital crossroads. This is a really, really uh, interesting, uh, interesting moment for the banking. So, what to do? Uh, uh, still, lots of things to do. Lots of investments ahead. We know that banks are experiencing this uh, ever-growing. Uh, uh, compliance issues, uh, no legal acts to comply. So investments are needed each year more and more. Uh, and uh, so far banks were um, used to do everything themselves, uh, create products, sell themselves. But uh, looking what is happening around, yes, this ecosystem concept, that's no option, uh, uh, option uh, anymore. So uh, you can apply some other classics uh, like uh, Mark Twain described on a very important business model uh, in Tom Sawyer book that, uh, uh, yes, from one side you can paint uh, the wall yourself, uh, but uh, you can uh, make uh, this uh, wall so attractive uh, that uh, actually they are, this wall is painted uh, by your friends and, and partners and they are actually even paying for you to have an uh, opportunity to paint on, on, on your wall. So it's basically business model of Apple and Google. Yeah? If you open App Store or, 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 or Google Store, um, Android Store, then uh, uh, very few applications are developed by Apple and Google themselves. It's another are applying or supplying to this uh, to this modern ecosystem. 
Oh, yes, and uh, nowadays uh, there are uh, so two options. Yeah, you can still uh, be big shark or big whale uh, trying to survive, but looks that uh, more agile is this uh, ecosystem concept. Yes, some fishes are eaten by some sharks, but at the end, uh, sharks are easier to attack. But this ecosystem is it's adjusting uh, to conditions and 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 environment around. So uh, now one more number, uh, 1.2 billion. Uh, what is 1.2 billion? Uh, this is about uh, Swedbank. Uh, we are very, very well capitalized uh, to go ahead with those challenges. But this is not what you think. Uh, these are not 1.2 uh, billion uh, euros or sec or whatever. These are 1.2 billion uh, interactions with customers. These are 1.2 billion interactions of customers we had uh, last year in Swedbank Group, Baltics and Sweden together. And if we will succeed in uh, capitalizing or, 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 or improving this interface or moving to this mobile, these are uh, 1.2 billion opportunities to speak to the customers. And we are very keen uh, to, to go there and to go there not, not, uh, not alone, but uh, together with partners. So uh, good ideas, as we always say, are coming through, but uh, now together with, uh, with partners and friends. So that's from my side. Thank you. It's still 100% track record of keeping this schedule for this event. Just great. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, oh, they are all being saved for, for the second part. So, uh, science in Latvia is supposed to be poor, but in this scientific conference, we, in coffee break, I think we have a little bit more than coffee. I don't mean alcohol, but, but something more. So, uh, uh, yes, yes. So, you have uh, half an hour to enjoy coffee. Uh, uh, snacks and, and, and conversations.